Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and thank you, Richard, very much for the introduction. Uh, and also, thank you to uh, the organisers of this conference for giving us a platform to uh, hear everybody's views and, and specialist subjects here, and also allowing us a chance to share some of our experiences with you so that we can all move forwards uh, to engage better in uh, oil spill response in the future. Um, the theme of this talk captures the... Uh, the middle one of the, the conference theme, so looking at synergy, uh, and in particular, looking at synergy between the salvage aspects of a response and the pollution aspects, the pollution response aspects. Um, before I start, though, I would like to point out a couple of uh, quite significant caveats. Uh, the first is that I am not a salvage expert. I don't pretend to be in any way whatsoever. Um, I work for the pollution response side, um, but through our experiences, um, I've had uh, the pleasure of, of working with salvage uh, organizations in, in a, some recent local cases. Uh, and I'd just like to tease out some of our observations, uh, which we feel are good uh, lessons that have been learnt, which could be replicated uh, in other cases in the future. Um, the second point I'd like to make is just that the, the cases I'm about to talk about, uh, I'm looking at very, very small aspects of those cases, really just to, to draw a, a, a small lesson. Um, each of the incidents that occur, maritime incidents, obviously have a lot of complex factors that surround them, depending upon the situation, uh, and also quite a lot of social and political pressure associated with each of them, making them uh, very di diverse and, and dynamic situations. I don't have the time to go into those details, uh, but if anybody is interested to discuss that further, obviously I'll be happy to talk with you um, after, after this session. Okay. Ah, there we go. So um, I'll be looking at three things. First of all, uh, I'd just like to point out that ITOPF uh, is not only concerned with oil pollution, which is, which, uh, which is what everybody automatically associates us with. Uh, and then I'll look at some of the synergies between salvage and pollution response for oil pollution, HNS response, uh, and also to do with socioeconomic impacts. And then I'll just draw that together with a couple of uh, conclusions for moving forwards. So, first of all, a very shameless plug about what we do. Um, since 2010, sorry, I'm having a little trouble here with the. Since 2010, um, about 20% 20 of the incidents that we've attended around the world uh, have not been related to oil. They're to do with other cargoes, uh, and that is quite a core part of our business. This really falls into two categories, so we're looking at either bulk cargoes. Um, such as the, the coal that you can see deposited on a, an Indonesian shore there on the left, um, or smaller packaged cargoes as you would find in containers. And obviously the big issue at the moment and, and a rising topic in pollution response is plastics. And in the last four years, ITOP have responded on site to five cases involving plastics, four of which have been to do with uh, nurdles, the, the tiny plastic uh, pre-production pellets that we have. In addition to that, we also deal with HNS, hazardous and noxious substances. Uh, and this can take two forms, um, either on board container ships, where obviously you have a very diverse mix of cargo on board uh, and a range of DG which can be present, um, or to do with the bulk carriage of uh, HNS on board chemical tankers. In order to provide these services, ITOF have three PhD level chemists in our organization within our responders. And we also have an ongoing permanent contract with an agency called Chemtrek, which is one of the world's leading suppliers of solutions for uh, DG response. In addition to the pollution response, we can also help to advise on-site um, with regards to the damage which may be caused from pollution either to the environment or damage to socio-economic resources, such as fisheries and tourism, uh, which obviously uh, are both found around the shorelines of, of most countries around the world. So that's just a little bit of what we do. In terms of the synergies with regard to oil pollution, uh, I just want to look at two cases which has happened in the Indian Ocean uh, quite recently and just contrast a little bit uh, the differences between them. The first was the New Diamond incident of VLCC carrying almost 280,000 cubic meters of Kuwaiti crude oil, uh, which caught fire um, off the shore of Sri Lanka. 
The firefighting response was organized with the Indian Coast Guard, with the Sri Lankan Navy and Coast Guard, and also with Smith Salvage, who were appointed uh, and flew in from, uh, from Europe to attend to that. Unfortunately, it was a tragic case because one member of the crew was lost in the fire. But overall, the result of the uh, response to the fire was very, very positive, And the cargo of this ship was saved. And the catastrophic oil loss, which could have occurred, didn't happen. So it was really a very positive result for potential environmental and socioeconomic damage, which would have affected probably uh, a vast proportion of the Bay of Bengal. Within this situation, though, despite the positive response, th there was a small issue that we saw from the pollution response side. And that was that because of the condition of this ship, with it being very far offshore, and with the limited communications which were in place because they were at sea to communicate back to the land, there was not a lot of synergy and cohesion between the pollution response efforts and, and the strategy being put in for contingency and the state of the salvage which was occurring. This communication issue was exacerbated by the fact that we were responding in the height of the COVID pandemic and very strict quarantine measures were put in place. So there was no centralized incident command system where everybody could come in every day and get updates. We were all in silos and we were all detached from each other. So from a pollution response side, it was very frustrating uh, and it was very confusing at times to understand the exact risk that was presented at any one point. And so we would develop strategies and we would hypothesize about what might be occurring but we were very limited in the way that we were able to share those strategies and our preparations with stakeholders that were involved, such as the Indian authorities, the Sri Lankan authorities, and also the salvers who were out on the ship. So it, it was a very good case overall, but there were some breakdowns in communication which were a problem. If you compare this with the Wakashio, which took place in the south of the Indian Ocean, also in 2020, the COVID situation there created almost the reverse effect. Because of the quarantine regulations, all of the salvage operators and all of the pollution response operators were put together in the same hotel. And this allowed them to communicate not, not only in the, the daily uh, operational meetings, but also throughout the day, throughout the night, and really just have free conversations whenever they needed. And because everybody had uniform understanding of the pollution risks and when those risks changed, and what the profile looked like at different times, contingency strategies and response strategies were able to be formed in very real time and with the agreements and buy-in of all the different stakeholders concerned. So it was a very different picture. So with response to oil pollution, it's going back to basics a little bit, but just to say that we have seen this in very recent times, it's just important to remember some clear fundamentals every time we go into a response. Firstly, setting up clear communication between all parties. Secondly, trying as soon as possible to form a clear link between the salvage responders and the pollution responders so that everybody uh, is aware of the real-time situation. And thirdly, to make sure daily incident command meetings exist, which have all stakeholders involved. You need to have all parties involved in order to develop a solution and a competent contingency which will satisfy all stakeholders. And this really is a fundamental which can never be overlooked. With regards to H&S pollution, I'd like to focus on the Express Pearl incident, which of course took place off the coast of Sri Lanka um, last year. The fire on board the Express Pearl raged for about five days, uh, and it was obviously driven by quite strong winds, and the fire spread very quickly and was very violent, and it was impossible to control the blaze. That blaze, however, was attended again by the Indian Coast Guard, the Sri Lankan Coast Guard and the Navy, and also by Smith Salvers. On board were about 1,400 containers, 81 of which contained dangerous goods within 15 different uh, categories. Now, unfortunately, at the start of this response, at the very start while the fire was going on, we didn't have uh, direct contact with Smith Salvage, but we were working closely with the fire experts of Burgoynes, who'd been appointed by the PNI Club, 
and the communication with them and the risk assessments that we did with them was very good and it was very, very clear. The one issue that we had which I'd like to highlight is that in these incidences, time is a very, very precious resource. There's lots of risk, there's lots of um, potential danger and hazards that need to be avoided as best as possible. And we were aware as we were going through our risk assessments and trying to understand what was occurring that the same work may be being duplicated by SMIT and by other attending authorities such as the Indian Coast Guard. And potentially this duplication of effort may cause issues, partly because we're using too many resources, but also partly because we may draw different conclusions and we may have different priorities and, and present different risk profiles. And that could cause confusion at a critical point in the response. And so we feel that potentially there is greater synergy that could be achieved with the assessment of the hazard profile of HNS incidents. It's critical in cases like this where you have 1,400 containers on board, but when you talk about mega container ships, which we will hear about in the next uh, session, which potentially can have 20,000 uh, plus containers on board, it becomes essential that that work is operated in the most efficient and most effective manner. So I would like to point out that that's not necessarily a typical case, uh, the Express Pearl. There is, in fact, no typical case for, for H&S incidents. For us, sometimes it can be very, very simple, uh, just providing a risk profile for um, a spillage of bulk cargoes, such as bauxite, potentially, or coal or granite into the water, and what the effects might be um, on, on the marine environment. But they can be much more complex, and they can be much more dangerous, and the implications can be much, much greater. So what we'd like to suggest is that to avoid this duplication of effort and the potential conflicts, we do have greater synergy. And the first point is just communication and establishing those channels of communication. But the second point, and this is a, really a suggestion, and I'm, I'm not sure how feasible this is, but to have a discussion whereby the different agencies involved pre-plan the way that those risks will be evaluated and the way they'll be reported. At the moment, there's no single format for assessing H&S risks, which we would do, which SALVAs would do, which the authorities would do. So when you look at different risk assessments, the information won't necessarily match up, and you won't be able to see where the differences lie or where work has been missed or where things have been duplicated. And if in peacetime we could prepare this slightly better, I think it will help to expedite the risk assessment when it happens in real time. So if there's a flavor for that, if people are interested in that, I know my colleagues who are in the HNS section of our organization would be delighted to have that discussion and try and develop that further. Um, the very last point I'd like to make is just about socioeconomic impacts. Um, and this touches upon some of the work that uh, Resolve, who are also in the room, uh, undertook with us for the Express Pearl. When the fire occurred that you can see there and the vessel sunk, uh, lots of debris started to fall over the side uh, and wash down um, into the sea and, and, and travel across the sea floor. And the Sri Lankan authorities, to avoid the risks of potential chemical contamination or physical damage to fishing, set up a fishing ban along uh, a very large area of the shoreline that you can see in this red box here. This extensive ban meant that um, about 17 to 18,000 individual, individual uh, fishing families were affected by this, obviously causing an impact on their livelihood and also potentially uh, on their nutrition. We worked with an organization called RPS to conduct some modeling to understand where containers and debris which had fallen off the ship uh, would head to and to see if we could minimize this area at all. And then using that information, the Indian Navy and the Sri Lankan Coast Guard and NARA, the National Aquatic Research uh, Agency, undertook some uh, underwater surveys to determine where potential debris might exist on the sea floor. And you can see that in the green dots here. Resolve then appointed an agency called DEEP, which used side scan sonar surveys uh, to provide a much more detailed, almost photo mosaic 
um, image of what could be seen on the seabed. And you can see on the slides here some of the categories that were assigned for different debris that was found. From these images, they were able to pick out 185 targets that may have been related to the ship. Those are the yellow dots. And from this, we were able to work with the Department of Fisheries to minimize that fishing ban area and minimize the impacts on the local fishing community. And so that was really, really significantly reduced about uh, five months after the incident occurred, once the sea state had settled down again. Resolve then worked over a period of about two months to collect all of that debris. And then this fishing ban was able to be lifted. And all that remains now is a two kilometer uh, shipping exclusion zone around the wreck, uh, which will be removed once the wreck is recovered, once the um, northeast monsoon returns uh, towards the end of October, November this year. So it's just a small little vignette, but it does show how different aspects of the response working together can really help to reduce the impacts that are felt upon a nation state. So that's all of my talk, um, but really just some very brief conclusions that I'd like to, to point out. The first is regarding oil pollution, that we really have to remember the basics and make sure communication is established at the beginning uh, and all key parties are in play. The second is regarding h &S response and really thinking about the most efficient ways we can uh, develop risk assessments to include different parties and to draw on the expertise of all those parties so everybody is working in the same direction. And then thirdly, to continue looking at potential synergies throughout the entire length of a response to find out if there are ways where we can utilize our different areas of expertise to limit the degree of damage which is caused to affected communities. So thank you very much. Oil Spill India 2022 is dedicated to the Honorable Prime Minister's Swachh Bharat Abhiyan and Clean Seas.